during the oral. This is our 17th lecture. The topic is exploring the oral microbiota by metagenomics approach from bacteria to archaea. Um, we have the, the pleasure of welcoming uh, a number of people, of members of our uh, steering committee of the logical reasoning in um, human genetics. Um, I see here uh, Professor Joseph de Williger, Professor Joseph Lee, uh, Professor Sonia Abdelhaq uh, from um, the um, Logical Reasoning in Human Genetics uh, Steering Committee. Um, but also today we have with us as a speaker, uh, Dr. Feriel Bouzi, uh, who is a postdoc researcher at the Laboratory of Molecular and Cellular Screening Processes at the Center of Biotechnology of SFAX uh, in Tunisia. And um, uh, Dr. Bouzid uh, is the speaker. She will be uh, introduced by our, um, by another great uh, guest that we're very happy to welcome with us today, uh, Dr. Ahmed Erbaï from the same uh, center, the Center of Biotechnology of SFAX. Um, who is also um, a um, uh, specialist and a scholar in uh, biostatistics and bioinformatics. Uh, he studied in France and Tunisia, and he worked in uh, different institutes and universities. So we, will, we are very happy to have him with us today. And um, Dr. Bay, the floor is yours. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Yosef. Thank you. Uh, welcome, everybody. I think that this will be... Uh, very hot topic to discuss today because it's not really classic genetics or maybe the, the, within the, the core of what we call genetics. But now we, much more emphasis is put on the, this interplay between what we have in our body, that means our cells containing our DNA and the other cells that are in our gut or, or everywhere in our organs and that also interact in some way or another. We don't know which is the cause of what, what causes what. Actually, if we are talking about healthy people or even diseased people. So I think Feriel will be giving some insights into that. And Feriel, actually, she's uh, the uh, maybe the only microbiologist that joined our team. Actually, our team is has been formed now maybe 15 years ago. And most of us are, are geneticists uh, and also part of of us are biostatisticians. I mean, they are coming from statistical genetic community. And Ferriel was very welcome because she did her PhD in France, in microbiology. And then four years ago, she joined our group as a postdoc fellow. So she was involved in different projects that, that we have in, in the lab. Uh, and she, she came a few months before the COVID outbreak. So. She was particularly involved with us in the COVID project in sequencing the COVID genome and so on, and analyzing all of that. And at the same time, we were working on, on a project on cardiovascular diseases. And we started from the genetic part, the human genome part, association studies, uh, et cetera. And then we move it to the microbiota. So Friel was very welcome because she's coming with her expertise in microbiology and and she learned a lot in analyzing the data. So I think she will get the opportunity to show you what she has done, particularly with my colleague, Najla Harat. I think, I hope she's, she already joined it. Um, this is five years projects now in collaboration with the, the University Hospital of Sfax. So Feriel, the floor is yours. You can start your conference. Uh, and after that, of course, we will get, uh, I guess, very dynamic and very rich discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Ahmed, for the introduction. So I will share my screen to start my talk. It's OK. Mm -hmm. So uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, I will present myself. So my name is Friar Bouzid. I have received my PhD in biology, microbiology from the University of Marseille. And actually I am a postdoctoral researcher at the laboratory LPCMC at the Center of Biotechnology of Facts. 
So I'm really pleased to be here with you today and to participate to this virtual conference organized by Colombia Global Center of Tunis. And today I will uh, talk about the exploration of the oral microbiota by metagenomics approach from bacteria to archaea. So at first I will start with a short introduction. So in our lab, we were interested in the human oral microbiota, which harbors the second most abundant uh, microbiota after the uh, gut microbium. So oral microorganisms include bacteria, archaea, viruses, and protozoa. Interestingly, the oral microbiota is stable, but remains susceptible to alterations due to infections or other stresses leading to oral microbiome dysbiosis. And this imbalance can lead to systemic inflammation affecting the whole body. So in this context, the World Health Organization considers the oral health as a key indicator of the overall health. In fact, oral microbiome disposes can predispose to other systemic diseases in distal six, as cardiovascular diseases, cancers, diabetes, Alzheimer's disease, and rheumatoid arthritis. The association of the oral microbiota with systemic diseases was correlated with abundance increase or decrease of oral pathogenic bacteria. For example, uh, the uh, Phila, Porphyrimonas, Prevotella, and Compilobacter oral species were shown to be increased in abundance in, in individuals presenting cardiovascular diseases. And this suggests that the oral microbiota may provide potential biomarkers in the diagnosis of some systemic diseases. So based on previous studies, oral dysbiosis is associated with an increased risk of cardiovascular diseases through systematic inflammation or systemic inflammation. Initially, oral pathogenic bacteria causes local oral inflammation, inducing the production of pro-inflammatory pro cytokines and the latter have access to the circulation through inflammatory oral tissues or through the gastrointestinal tract, resulting in systemic inflammation triggering cardiovascular events. From cardiovascular diseases, we were especially interested in coronary artery disease, which is known to be a multifactorial cardiovascular disorder linked to a number of modifiable risk factors and non-modifiable risk factors under the variable contribution of multiple genetic parameters. In Tunisia, uh, CAD represents an increasing mortality rates and represents a serious public health problem. Interestingly, periodontal pathogenic bacteria were even detected in atherosclerotic plaques. In fact, oral pathogenic bacteria contribute to the formation of atherosclerotic plaques through different ways, direct deposition in vascular lesion, blood dissemination of pro-inflammatory factors, the production of reactive oxygen species, and the production of bacterial proteins, which contribute to the aggravation of dyslipidemia. Now, I will present our first research concerning the oral microbiota. So our projects aim to profile the oral microbiota in coronary patients by targeted metagenomic sequencing. The specific goals were to compare the oral microbiota composition between patients and controls and uh, to identify a potential pathogenic signature associated with CAD. So the global strategy of our projects required the recruitment of coronary patients and control subjects, saliva collection and DNA extraction, followed by methagenomic uh, profiling of salivary microbiomes by NGS, and finally, a deep bioinformatic and biostatistic analysis. In more detail from the Department of Cardiology of CSU Hedishekar, of SFAX, we recruited 20 coronary patients and 10 control subjects with CD risk factors and meeting the same inclusion criteria. 
Age over 45 years, no smokers, free from other inflammatory diseases, no taking treatments, and presenting no dental caries, which are susceptible to alter the oral microbiota. And in addition, so uh, patients were subjected to medical examinations to determine the coronary status, and the syntax score grading the complexity of CAD was calculated for all patients. In addition, all participants answered a questionnaire containing uh, personal information, medical history, uh, nutritional habits, which allows us to evaluate the obesity status and adherence to Mediterranean diet for all participants. And from medical records, we also collected the laboratory data and uh, medications. Here, I would like to notice that the sampling step of our projects took two entire years. Now, after patient recruitment and data collection, I precise that targeted metagenomics approach was adopted to perform oral microbiota profiling. So sequencing was performed on Illumina MySec platform of the Center of Biotechnology OSFAX. Here, the 16S rRNA gene was chosen as marker gene, and especially the hypervariable region V3, V4 was targeted. Then, uh, bioinformatics analysis were performed using the KIMI2 pipeline. Here, we implemented for the first time in the laboratory two analysis strategy, the operational taxonomic units based analysis, and the applicant sequence variant ISV based analysis. So briefly, OTU sets or clusters are created with identity clustering methods, whereas ISV sets are created with denosing methods, which is a new computational approach to distinguish biological sequences from sequencing errors. Then to compare between the oral microbiota composition between patients and controls, differences in diversity was first assessed by alpha diversity or the number of what you observed in each sample. Then the beta diversity was assessed to compare the diversity between samples. We also performed other uh, statistical analysis as random forest, which allows uh, the detection of the most significant taxa, and oncom, which can be used for longitudinal analysis of microbial composition. So for the, for, uh, the results in the first step, we determined the composition of the oral microbiota. At the film level, the oral microbiota of patients and controls was dominated by six bacterial phyla from a total of 20 detected phyla. And this observation is in accordance with the current knowledge of the oral, comp uh, oral composition as reported by the Human Oral Microbiome Database. In our study, we noticed that the oral microbial communities in patients and controls are represented by similar core oral microbiome. Now, at the genus level, a total of 168 different genera were detected, including 162 in CD samples and 122 in controls. We observed three dominant genera in both groups, including Streptococcus, Veona, and Nisseria. And for this dominant genera, no significant difference was found between both groups. And in accordance with previous studies, these bacterial genera were also reported with high relative abundance in the oral microbiota of coronary patients and controls. Interestingly, Streptococcus and Veona were also detected in ateromatous plaques and were considered as plaque-associated bacteria. In the second step, we compared the oral microbiota diversity between controls and cases. The alpha diversity analysis showed no significant difference in species richness between patients and controls. Also, the beta diversity analysis showed no significant difference, but an outlier CD sample. 
In addition, uh, Random Forest and Ancom did not reveal a significant difference in the composition of the oral microbiota always between patients and controls. So here, while standard statistical analysis showed no significant difference, we decided to perform deepest statistical analysis. Interestingly, we have identified a recent study which developed variable selection methods of microbium compositional data analysis by regression models. So here I precise that we use variable selection by last supernalized regression model. And the goal is to identify microbial signature that are able to discriminate between CAD and non-CAD individuals. Briefly, LASSO allows selection of the most influential taxa, taking into account several explanatory variables. Interestingly, the results identified a single bacterial genus, Echinella, as the most influential for CAD status, with a higher abundance in CAD patients, particularly at early stage, compared to the control group. So from the literature, we knew that Echinella is a proteobacteria, usually found in the oral cavity and gastrointestinal tract, reported as a periodontal pathogen. Interestingly, Echinella is implicated in infective endocarditis and was detected in atherosclerotic plaques. Also, the pro-inflammatory effects of Echinella on human coronary artery endothelial cells was reported. Then, this periodontal pathogen could be a major contributor, enhancing the atherosclerotic process by inducing endothelial inflammation. On the other side, apart from bacteria, we unexpectedly detected the presence of the archaeal genus Metarumbrevibacter in three samples, but at very low relative abundance. And here, the question was, are there a classification artifact or a meaningful biological feature? So this question was addressed in our second study. Briefly, the archaea genus Metanobrevibacter, including methanogen-producing archaea, are considered as a minor component of the oral microbium. However, its roles in oral seeds are still poorly understood. So methanogens have been implicated in oral diseases, including periodontitis and other human diseases as obesity and chronic constipation. So the identification of this minor taxa remains challenging due to the sensitivity and limits of detection. Then the impact of such low abundant microorganisms in oral dysbiosis is overlooked. Here, this figure shows the geographic distribution of, study, uh, of studies of archaea in oral samples evidencing that most studies were developed in Europe. And this figure interestingly highlights that the oral archaeum is not yet explored in North Africa and poorly studied in saliva. We then aim to present deep characterization of methanogen Indonesian adult saliva using polyphasic molecular approach for archaeal identification and quantification. And we aim then to report the first data on the prevalence of methanogens in North Africa from Tunisian salivary samples. To do that, a total of uh, 43 saliva samples were included. Uh, included. So methanogenic Ampli sequencing, standard 16S rRNA amplification, followed by Sanger sequencing were, were performed as an initial screening to detect the presence of methanogens in the oral microbiota. Further investigations were performed using specific quantitative real-time PCR targeting Emoralis and M. smithy, which are uh, known to be the most frequently detected methanogen in the oral microbiota. Interestingly, in our study, the observed prevalence of methanogens widely varies depending on the methodology. 
So by 16S rna based metagenomics, only uh, 11 percent uh, of saliva samples presenting, presented the archaeal genus with low average abundance frequency. Here I precise that the archaeal domain was only detected by the OTU-based analysis and now by the ISV-based analysis. Then, with an improved protocol of standard uh, PCR targeting the universal 16S rRNA and sequencing, uh, so here we detected metanogens in 46% of our samples, uh, including six cases with confirmed M oralis by sequencing. Thereafter, uh, with quantitative real-time PCR, methanogens were detected in a largest number of sample of uh, 81 persons. So these findings uh, suggest that methanogen methanogenic uh, approach was the least sensitive method to explore the archaeal community in the uh, oral microbiota. Unfortunately, no statistical associations were observed between the presence of the quantity of methanogens in saliva and study population characteristics. We only noticed a significant statistical association between the detection of M. smithy and poor adherence to Mediterranean diet, suggesting a potential association or a potential impact of diet on M. smithy prevalence. So now it's time to conclude. So through our study, we studies, we characterized the oral microbiota in deceased and control individuals for the first time in North Africa. We detected a different abundance distribution of the genus Echinella in oral samples of coronary patients compared to controls. So our findings support the impact of periopathogens of the oral microbiome that may translocate from the oral cavity to another body seat where they may contribute to coronary artery disease through an inflammatory process. We also reported a high prevalence of methanogens in saliva samples from North African population, indicating that methanogens are universally present in the oral cavity. And we noticed that the uh, universal approach using meth methanogenic, methanogenomic or standard 16S rRNA sequencing still overlook the human archaeum and partially failed to picture the diversity of archaeal signatures. Finally, I will pass to the discussion section. So at first, I would like to discuss the limitations of targeted metagenomic approach. Let's say that uh, this approach presents several methods associated BA. I think that sampling is critical and a key step in metagenomic approach. The selection criteria uh, for individual recruitment should be considered with caution to ensure a comparable and homogeneous sampling. Also, the sample size is uh, very important to uh, and affects directly all downstream statistical analysis. Even the DNA extraction kit is very important and determinant to have access to the largest number of microorganisms. Limitations could also be linked to the choice of the Iber variable region uh, in the 16S rRNA and the sequencing platform. These two uh, choices determine the sensitivity to detect some taxa at the species level, but overall, the uh, targeted metagenomics approach is not sufficiently sensitive to describe the microbial composition at the species level. Then, as we see before, data analysis is a determinant step to refine the microbial uh, profiles, including choices of bioinformatics pipeline and uh, biostatistical tests. Uh, just I would like to say that with our little experience, we think that the core microbiome or the most abundant uh, bacteria or dominant bacteria will be detected whatever the methods with minor differences, but minor taxa could be largely overlooked. 
So to overcome these problems, we hope that in the near future in Tunisia, we will be able to perform shotgun metagenomic sequencing to recover whole genome sequences in human microbiota and to profile taxonomic composition and functional potential of microbial communities. So this approach has multiple advantage compared with the 16S amplicon methods, including improved accuracy of species detection, increased detection of diversity, and increased prediction of genes. But on the other side, it demands a performance or more performance sequencing platform and more complex uh, bioinformatic analysis. Now the question is, what about human genetics? So in general, diseases that are linked to the microbium are also controlled by host genetic factors. And this is the case for cardiovascular diseases, which are known to be uh, human complex diseases, displaying an interaction between human genes, external environmental factors, and internal environmental factor that is the microbium. Since both host genetics and the microbium can affect host traits, so understanding the, understanding the interaction between these two factors is a determinant step in uncovering their respective rules in disease. In this context, current trends in genetics focus on host microbium interaction. In a simple way, three possible directions of host microbium environment interaction in the context of host phenotypes could be discussed. So in the first possibility is that host genetic polymorphism with or without the environmental effects will influence host phenotype independently of host microbiome interaction. The second possibility is that host genetic variation and microbiome change, both influenced by uh, environmental factors, affect host genotype regulation, which will control the host phenotype. And the third possibility is that the microbiome environment interaction will directly affect host phenotype independently of host genetic. Now, on a practical level, microbiome genome-wide association studies, or MGOs, uh, were proposed as a new approach to elucidate the interaction of host genetic variation with the microbium. So M uh, MGWOS aims to identify the host genetic polymorphisms that interact with its microbium using microbium attributes such as alpha diversity, beta diversity, or relative abundance of bacterial taxa as the response variable or as the phenotype, and host genotype data as the explanatory variables. So here, several or few uh, uh, studies reported MGOs uh, in different uh, disease uh, contexts like uh, cancers and Parkinson uh, diseases, and uh, they identified host SMP associated with the abundance of several bacterial taxa. So in the future, uh, results from MGOs and human GOs will clarify on effect of host microbium association on the phenotype and provide insights in a biological system by giving a better view of the interaction networks that underlie expression of host phenotype. On another side, it is important to consider how host microbium interactions can influence gene regulation. A possible scenario is that EQTL could potentially modulate the changes in gene regulation induced by host microbium interaction. So identification of EQTL for microbium traits may provide mechanistic insights into how microbium can interact with host genetic variation. Finally, I would like to say that 
clearly we are in the very early stage of this new field, but it is already apparent that multiple approach and different types of genetics tools will be necessary to truly understand the genetics of this very complex host microbial interaction. So that's all. At the end, I would like to thank the organizers of Columbia Global Center of Tunis for their invitation to talk. I also thank the LPCMC team who contributed to this project, especially Dr. Najla Harat, who conceived and supervised uh, this study. Also, Professor Ahmed Derbei, who uh, was very help helpful for statistic uh, analysis and surely you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Feriel, for this brilliant presentation. And thank you also for putting the discussion on the, on the good direction. <laughs> By <laughs> the last slides, you raised most of the points that are, in effect, problematic in, in understanding this interplay between what we call microbiome, different microbiomes in, in our body and our genes or our DNA in the cells. I would also welcome again to everyone, welcome to my colleague Najla who joined it. She was the, the supervisor of this work, the, the first, the, the two parts of, of the work and the project is ongoing. So she can maybe, uh, of course, be part of this discussion to clarify some, some of uh, the issues that have been raised during your talk. Just to maybe to follow on, on, on uh, your last part of the, uh, the discussion in your slides, this new approach of trying to identify the, the interplay or the interaction between host genome and the microbiota in, in our bodies, uh, in fact, GWAS have been used very recently, and we have one year study, I mean, one of the most uh, important studies uh, that have been published one year ago in Nature Genetics, and including about something like 7,000 individuals, um, just to see if the abundance of particular species, so this is a very big work, uh, I think I have the, the summary here, it's involving something like uh, using the abundance of 200 taxa um, in 7,700 participants. This is a, a big project project called the Dutch Microbiome Pro Project. And they were able, however, to identify some particular genes that are linked directly to the abundance of some, some species. So this is one of the first, I mean, findings that we have, for example, in this study, they found that the, the lactose intolerance um, gene and the blood, the ABO blood gene, were directly involved in the abundance of, of some species. Also, there is a Chinese study that had been published three years ago, MGO study, of course, which link, trying to link the, find the SNPs that are, uh, statistically associated to abundance of some species, and they also have some interesting find, findings in, in, that, uh, in that way. They even estimated some heritability. Uh, here we have the link with the, <laughs> the statistical genetics parts. They estimating, for example, heritability of something like 40% for some species in the gut microbiota that are linked to some some genetic influence. That means that some of the species may be directly, I mean, quite stable in their uh, irritability of the genetic interplay between the, the genome of the individuals and the, uh, the composition of the microbiota. So this is one of the most interesting fields for the, the coming years, I think. It will be interesting to discover. So the discussion is open. Uh, Najla, my colleague Harat, is here. She, she also can add something or maybe herself clarify some of the objectives of the study. Uh, we also have my colleague uh, Balqis Hawela from the Pasteur Institute and the Faculty of Medicine of Tunis. She's very welcome. She's a colleague and a friend. So, uh, 
Alqis, feel free to uh, to add anything or ask any question or maybe raise some points for the, that are relevant for the, the discussion. So the room is open for questions. Um, I've, I've uh, some very basic questions about the uh, the concepts. It's, it's a logical reasoning uh, course. I thought I'd ask some very simple things that I'm naive to this field of microbiome, but there obviously must be issues about the oral microbiome related to both environment as well as genes, as well as everything else. So like, is there a lot of variation between different ethnicities or is it geography that matters? Because obviously diet will affect it and things that are around you. Um, so I, I guess for me, the question was, how do you dissect what's cause, what's effect, what's related to diet versus maybe host genetic differences, like ethnic differences versus cultural differences in terms of diet and all these sort of basic things. So for me, the questions are much more simple than the, <laughs> than, than the technical details. I just want to understand the concepts better. And those seem like the, the things to me that would be the most difficult as someone naive to the field. So I'd love to hear your thoughts from any of you. Okay, so surely the uh, oral microbiota presents a uh, huge variability between individuals and between different uh, populations, and uh, this is uh, related to the uh, uh, diet habits or uh, uh, other stress or infections. But uh, when we uh, conducted our study, mm -hmm. uh, we um, we found that the core oral microbiome or the most dominant taxa are the same as uh, it was described by other studies in other uh, populations. For example, uh, when uh, comparing our studies with uh, Swedish or, uh, uh, or Germany uh, studies, we found that the six dominant phyla are the same as we see in Tunisia and in Europe, for example. So the, um, uh, the differences will be uh, in the uh, less abundant taxa. It, uh, it, uh, dominant taxa will be always uh, detected and dominant and uh, minor taxa will change, will present change uh, depending on diet. Mm -hmm. uh, this is the... Yeah, so you mentioned, like you mentioned, you mentioned something about the adherence to the Mediterranean diet, for example, right? And is that cause or effect? In other words, is the diet affecting the microbiome or is the microbiome affecting the diet or what's your hypothesis? I mean, because it seems to me that that's, that's the most difficult question is trying to... Yes, uh... <laughs> I think it, we don't have the uh, definitive or a clear uh, answer to this question, but there is an interplay between the uh, external factors and the internal sure. factors. So uh, the evolution, even in, in the same individual, the evolution of the microbiome uh, mm -hmm. present changes with mm -hmm. age and with uh, the uh, disease status of each individual. So uh, mm -hmm. there is... Um, multiple uh, variables which we, which uh, influence the microbiome diversity in each individual and uh, between individuals mm -hmm. so yeah, for yeah. example like when you're doing an analysis the difference from GWAS is that GWAS obviously the genes were there first so you're not looking at a reverse causation do you do different types of analysis to try to separate out these issues or or, or do you sample i mean how, how would you address the issue if you're asking the question like for example like if you look presumably in a big study like they had in holland or in your study there must be for example vegetarians versus meat eaters and that does that have an effect or do these other things have an effect just curious <laughs> yes uh it could be an interesting study but in in our study, I think that our sampling was homogeneous. So uh, we have tried to uh, uh, um, yeah, to have the stringent. information <laughs> the information about the uh, jet of our uh, 
patience and controls and overall uh, um, and Vidders presented uh, an um, adherence to uh, Mediterranean diet. So I think that we didn't have individuals uh, vegetarian or uh, uh, so it, it could be interesting for another uh, project, I think, to, uh, to see the difference. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I maybe I'm, I might add some, some few ideas about that. See. I mean, it's not easy to make something like decomposing the variability of the microbiome in which part is linked to environment, which part is linked to genetics, which part is linked to consuming, for example, to having some diet or smoking or, or so on. There are some issues that have been addressed in that using randomized trials, but we don't have, I mean, very convincing evidence that how much of this uh, variation in the microbiome, oral or gut or, or any other organ are influenced by the environment and by the genetics. So the studies are, many studies are ongoing. We have very partial answers to this question, but I think this is one of the, the fields that needs further investigation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How about um, you mentioned that there weren't a lot of studies in North Africa, but there were in other places. And you're saying there's not much difference of substance related to the variation, say, between Sweden and Tunisia, which is, I mean, initially surprising. since both the genetics are quite different for the human host as well as the diet and everything. Yeah. So why why is it so stable if it is that stable? Or is it just that we don't have the detailed measurement ability to yeah. see the differences. <laughs> One of the explanation is also is that the, the, uh, the sensitivity of the techniques yeah. we are using, yeah. we are seeing just the, those species or taxa mm -hmm. that we are able to detect. Mm -hmm. So maybe the difference is much more clear, much, much mm -hmm. larger in the minor components of the microbiota. And this is one of the, the challenges both at the technical and analysis level. So if you want to, for example, you say in one patient, I have one per thousand, the abundance is one per thousand, and in healthy controls, it's 0 0.9 per thousand. I mean, you might not be able to, to, to find any significant difference, at least you are using very large samples or having very sensitive techniques to, to, to measure this, these issues. And maybe one of the, the things when Friel presented the first part of her work, when we, most of the analysis, standard analysis techniques we use it, we find nothing significant. So we move it to penalized methods and penalized methods are actually, I mean, indicated in the case you have small samples and very large number of variables. Mm -hmm. So it's just making some, penalizing or regularizing some of the variables to make those that are the most influential to appear. So putting to zero some of the difference between species and you are amplifying the effect of the others just to try to find something interesting. Mm -hmm. So we have a lot to do on that. <laughs> I mean, particularly that in our context in Tunisia, we have, uh, I mean, concerns about budgets, about the, the techniques, about sequencing facilities we have to, to, to find the, uh, to do all this kind of work, yeah. What would happen, for example, if you took uh, Tunisians and say Dutch or Swedes, where you said they had also done these studies and just treated the ethnicity as the case and control and just looked for significant differences, do you see a lot or is it really nothing? Is that, I mean, because that would presumably be related, like you said, to the sensitivity of the experimental techniques, but there must be something, right? <laughs> yeah, sure. 
I think that uh, it could be very interesting to uh, to conduct meta-analysis, meta uh, taking uh, different populations mm -hmm. and to reanalyze the data with uh, with a common uh, bioinformatics yeah. analysis mm -hmm. and the common bioinformatics in a, uh, pipeline because there is uh, different methods uh, mm -hmm. B that can influence the results. Uh, personally, when uh, we implemented the uh, two uh, analysis pipeline with OTU-based analysis and ISV-based analysis, we observe with the same data dif differences in the right. results. <laughs> so I think that uh, uh, we should uh, consider or interpret the results with caution and uh, um, try to have um, homogeneous uh, parameters to mm -hmm. conclude uh, at the end. Mm -hmm. So, uh, right. yes, for the gut microbiome, uh, there is uh, many meta-analyses conducted by the oral microbiota. Uh, I think that uh, there is many things to do and uh, to, to have conclusions, uh, concluent conclusions. Yeah, thank you, Friel. I, I see that Balqis have asked two questions in the chat. So, Balqis, if you are here, you can just ask, ask them directly to Friel. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Ahmed. Nice to see you today. Yeah, nice to and, see you. And uh, my congratulations. Really interesting uh, presentation, Friel. Well thank conducted you. study and the main conclusion are clear um yeah thank you so much also for sonia she uh, make me able to join uh, to the panelists um yeah i'm interested because i'm conducting uh, right now another study on animals not on uh, patients but uh, we want to check the uh, imbalance in microbiota what we can gain and what we can uh, lose as a bacterial community after a program of, uh, uh, I mean, gavage for uh, rats. And this is really interesting, but we didn't uh, finish with uh, the, uh, I, I mean, the metagenomic study. So I don't have any conclusion actually, but I guess what is interesting is to, to see how uh, the imbalance could be really um, uh, linked and associated to the diseases. In your case, you are facing a patient with a cardiovascular disease or something like that. I don't yes, know yes. exactly what is it, CD or, yeah. And my, my question is, uh, yeah, Okay, you saw what is of high abundance, uh, but what about uh, the uh, family of uh, bacteria already in oral uh, compartment, let's say? And uh, because, yeah, uh, yeah, you already raised this question uh, there. Uh, I mean, variation depending of the common cell and the mutualistic bacteria that are uh, living in uh, oral compartments and uh, so my my question are you uh, you only mention one one uh, genus yes highly abandoned what does it mean what about the others i'm really interested to to have a um, profiling more uh, plenty profiling of what you can see in general not only the highly abundant but because doesn't mean uh, sometimes doesn't mean uh, something really relevant yeah, so it depends and my second question was yeah because I more or less always trying to have to associate uh, microbiome analysis and uh, study investigation with proteomic level because uh, it's it's interesting to see if they have 
the same proteomic profiling, even they don't have exactly or uh, differentially uh, microbiome uh, and bacteria, some bacteria abundance. Uh, do you think it's interesting to do that? Because uh, I, I'm pretty sure that, uh, yeah, you know, bacteria for, for, for our microbiome and our bacteria, we also secrete antipeptide, antibacterial peptides. So we don't know exactly the interaction that could be uh, uh, in, in that compartment. So we should link what we saw are differentially abundant in our compartment also by proteomic analysis to see if there are any differential profiling in proteomes, just to, to check if there increase in uh, antibacterial peptides in our oral compartment or not. This is just because I'm interested by, but by your uh, data, which are really interesting. I'm doing, uh, I'm working on uh, gut microbiota, so it's completely different. And uh, yeah, I, I don't know, what do you think about that? So yeah. uh, I agree with you that functional analysis are uh, the, are very important to address these questions. But I just want to say that our study is a preliminary and a pilot study, which aims to, uh, which is designed to profile the uh, composition of the oral microbiota and to compare the composition of the oral microbiota between patients and controls. And with uh, statistical analysis, uh, we consider that we identified um, a pathogenic uh, signature, which is um, a bacterial genus, uh, that it was um, abundant or more abundant in uh, CAD patients compared to controls. Um, I agree with you that, that uh, we have not um, informations or evidence of how this uh, genus uh, will affect the phenotype of the uh, deceased uh, individuals, but um, from the literature, uh, we knew that uh, this uh, bacteria or this genus will affect the uh, the cardio uh, cardiovascular events through an inflammatory process. Now, uh, I think that functional analyses are, uh, are important, P -p proteomic analyses are important, by, uh, but comparing amplicon based NGS or shotgun sequencing and proteomic analysis, uh, they don't address the same question and we, we will not have uh, the same answer. Uh, uh, answers. So, uh, for example, with amplicon based NGS, we it is designed for uh, studying the biodiversity of uh, uh, micro uh, microbial community. With uh, shotgun sequencing, we um, we can uh, have uh, informations uh, about genes and functions of uh, uh, microbial communities after uh, assemblies or reconstruction of whole uh, genomes. But uh, with proteomic analysis, I think that we will have another uh, answers about the mechanistic, maybe uh, 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 mechanistic effect of uh, the signatures on the uh, phenotype. Yeah, sure, sure. Mm -hmm. yeah, 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 thank you, Fariel. I saw that Sonia has raised her hand or maybe willing to answer some questions, Sonia? No, no, thank you. Uh, it was just to give the floor to, to Balqis. Thank you so much, actually. Okay. The, the talk was wonderful. Uh, I learned a lot. And uh, I think that the presentation made by Feriel, she brought uh, another level of complexity to something which is already complex at the level of the human being. Thank you. Yeah, thank yeah. you so much. Uh, 
and I just to add to this idea that actually we are in, a, in some circle, we don't know which the cause of what. So we don't know if the, how much the, the oral, the composition of the microbiome, whatever it is, is influenced by genetics of the host and how much of the disease that is complex by itself at the genetic level already, adding to this the complexity of how this ge genetics or genome influence the microbiome who itself can influence the disease. So is it something like adding effects, that interacting maybe with feedback loops, I mean, which can be controlled. Feriel talked about some of the, the, the molecules that are produced by bacteria might be involved in some network, we don't know what, that can itself regulate some gene expression. So we are in, in multiple, I mean, networks which are going in <laughs> interacting. <laughs> and, and I think this is one of the big challenges. Uh, last week I was discussing with, uh, with, a, with a colleague and we said that science actually has choose the, to make the, the, the world, to understand the world by decomposing problems and you know, if you want to decompose, let's see at the genetic, from the genetic lens, let's see what is happening in the genome and then regulation, methylation, and then microbiome and so on. We are adding parts and at the end, we are losing control. So we don't know when we are going to make the whole picture from that. And this is one of the things that I hope we, we can address in the, in the, the the coming decades, I don't know if I if we are being uh, we are still alive. Maybe fifty years <laughs> from now, maybe we can yeah. get a better look on the what is really happening on in this complexity. Thanks, Ahmed. Um, and uh, yeah. what about the competition between bacteria community? Yeah, I mean, yeah, Balkis, just to follow you on, on the, your question, the balance and, and balance and, and actually one of the, um, the most recent uh, statistical method, method to, to model that is that they are looking not only at the level of species abundance, but on some clusters of species that are going together yeah, or definitely. going <laughs> up or down together in their abundance. So again, this is one of the, the the challenges at the computational level, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Sonia? I have a question. Uh, so, so in the very beginning, uh, you said that the uh, microbiome species were very comparable between uh, Tunisians and Swedes and Dutch and so forth which I was very surprised as Wilger was saying. And, 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 and my question to that is, is the prevalence of coronary artery disease comparable in the two countries? And if they are, if they're not the same, and that the type of microbiome that are in the two populations are the same, then those are not the likely cause of the difference in coronary artery disease, right? So that I would eliminate that the common species that are playing a role, but it's probably as Balkis was mentioning that it's the, the less prevalent ones that may be causing this, contributing the, to the phenotypic variation. And the second thing that I would uh, like to ask is, and add, if I may, uh, is that, you have about 20 coronary artery disease and the 10 controls, correct? So now, if you were to take those 20 cases and the 10 controls and look at the siblings or somebody in the family, then you essentially have uh, somebody who is controlling for genetic background and thereby you minimize the, the variability in those people with and without the disease from the genetics perspective, and you can more fully look at the environmental contribution. However, of course, siblings are more likely to be exposed to similar type of uh, uh, relatives so that you may 
want to to pick some relatives who are living apart or something of that sort so that you can actually uh, manipulate the dimensions of the genetics and metagenetics uh, dimensions of these problem that you are uh, challenging yourself with, which is incredibly complex. I think human genetic by itself is messy, but you're adding on top of that a microbiome genomics. You know, I, I think that the problem is so massive uh, that I, I'm not quite sure how to reduce the dimensions of the problem so that you can actually manage in an effective way. So that's uh, those are two things that I like to uh, bring up. Thank you. So um, I just want to clarify that uh, to address the question if uh, an altered oral microbiota is associated uh, with CD uh, compared to controls. So uh, in the literature, only case controls studies uh, were performed. Uh, in different uh, study population, uh, Sweden, Germany, and uh, I think uh, India, and we are the uh, the only study uh, that uh, identified the genus, uh, uh, the bacterial genus Echinella. Uh, however, um, in the other one other study uh, identified, for example, the abundance of uh, anaeoglobus, which is uh, another uh, genus uh, bacterial species, as associated with uh, symptomatic atherosclerosis. So, as we said, yes, the dormant uh, taxa uh, are common between uh, all the studies, but the signatures was different and uh, it could be uh, an answer that uh, there is uh, um, a population uh, signatures or population specificities uh, of each uh, study. So uh, for the second part, I, I totally agree with you that it could be a, a good strategy to uh, uh, maybe to have uh, siblings or uh, other um, participants that are um, related uh, to the uh, deceased individuals. Uh, but let's say that um, uh, the sampling uh, step uh, remains very difficult, difficult in uh, our context. And uh, maybe I, I would like to say that one big uh, limitation of our study is the few number of, uh, of individuals, uh, 20 deceased person with 10 controls uh, is not uh, very uh, important. So uh, I think that all our findings should be validated on the largest and largest uh, um, court uh, size. Yeah, uh, this links with the, the question asked by Hamza, I think. I don't know if Hamza is, is here. He can maybe ask his question directly. Otherwise, I just opened the chat. And the first question, he, is, he said about the recruitment criteria. He said he, uh, we included 10 control subjects with CAD risk factors. And he would like to know why not including controls without CAD risk factors instead? Uh, yes, it is. Uh, there is two strategies in uh, control case uh, studies. And uh, a new uh, current trend is to, um, to recruit uh, controls with the same risk factors as a deceased person to eliminate the uh, uh, the possibility that these risk factors are, are related to the observed uh, difference. So uh, we choose uh, controls with CD risk factors to, to be sure, uh, forgive me, that uh, the, the observed signature is associated with the disease and not with other factors. But uh, we can see in other uh, studies th uh, that they choose to uh, controls without uh, risk factors. Uh, 
but I think that uh, the conclusions should be interpreted def differently. For yeah, the second... I mean, there is also a third option is that you can use three group comparison. I mean, you take cases, uh, controls with risk factor and controls without risk factor. This is one of the options. Also, of course, it needs, it's more difficult in the sampling, uh, mm -hmm. sampling part. The, uh, there is another question from Hamza about the power of this sample that is provided. This is classical question, but anyway, in this case, since we are, we have no choice than working with small samples, we, can't, we cannot really reason on the, the minimal difference we want to detect and how much people we need. Actually, it's hundreds. <laughs> Most of the time, it's hundreds if we want to detect small difference in in abundance on, or in frequency of some species. But we, I mean, we have the sample, we are collecting the sample and we are trying to find something interesting with that. It might come with having nothing interesting. Yes. <laughs> so in this case, you can go for, for a larger study, but actually this is one of the things we do. We have no choice of doing that. I don't know, I see that Mariam has something to say, or I'm... Um, Mariam? Um, I, I have a, a question or two. Um, how does, uh, have there been any studies where they look at the same person over time? I mean, how dynamic is this? It must be very dynamic, right, if you're changing diet, moving to going to abroad for a year or something and being exposed to things. Um, are there any studies that are out there? This, that's not really, obviously you haven't done it, but has anyone? In our lab, we don't uh, perform such sure. analysis. <laughs> but are there any uh, in the literature? Yes, uh, in the literature, uh, personally, I don't have idea, okay. but uh, I think that maybe there is a published article and maybe uh, it is uh, currently studied because <laughs> the question is uh, uh, is asked by the um, uh, the scientific community so i think that uh, we uh, will we have or yeah. we will have the uh, answer <laughs> Yeah, because it seems to me that's pretty important. Yes, right? <laughs> yes. Uh, sure. Um, the other thing is like uh, responding to something Joe said. Joe is asking about looking at families. And you mentioned before, I think, Ahmed, that there's a uh, heritability, right, to these traits, yeah, to the microbiome. But that could be either as either because of the genes or the shared environment in families. So that's, I think, quite a difficult question. But, you know, obviously something worth uh, eventually looking at. Um, another question that, I don't know, I'm naive. I don't know much about microbiome, so I'm asking naive, basic, first principles type question. But what's the difference between, I mean, if you look at the oral microbiome or the gut microbiome in the same person, do you expect to see, if something's causative, do you expect to see things in both? Or do you see things that are very different? Because both are obviously connected in some way, both to genes and diet and everything else. So why oral, for example, and why not gut? Or is there something known about the interrelationships? Uh, uh, the composition of uh, the gut microbiome is different from yeah. the composition of the oral sure. microbiome. There mm -hmm. is surely shared taxa, but mm -hmm. dominant taxa are different. Um, and uh, I think that um, many studies have uh, have established a mm -hmm. clear and clear association between uh, uh, CAD, for example, in our case, and uh, gut microbiome. Mm -hmm. And uh, there is even uh, gut microbiome related metabolites mm -hmm. that uh, were associated uh, with uh, CAD. So mm -hmm. uh, just to say that uh, the taxa are different, whatever mm -hmm. the uh, microbiota considered, uh, skin, uh, oral, uh, gut, uh, and uh, the signature will be uh, associated with diseases are different too. <laughs> so why oral? Why did you use oral? Uh, we, I think that we... Or originality. Uh, 
uh, uh, for the originality uh, and uh, because the uh, saliva collection is non-invasive it was uh, okay. <laughs> very simple to uh, to collect saliva <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, 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 I, I was just asking from the logical reasoning perspective <laughs> <laughs> perfectly and uh, i must add that joe that your question is far from being naive because we are asking something very important about which connection do we have in the different microbiomes we have in our body? I mean, do we talk, can we talk about microbiotic, but microbiota profile from multiple organs, multiple locations? I mean, the oral, the gut, maybe in other parts, skin, and so on. Can we talk about something as a whole? Mm. But looking at profiles in specific regions, the oral, the gut, and so on. So if we look at uh, as a whole entity, a whole person, individual, can we talk about something that goes together? Mm -hmm. What kind of correlation do we have between the, all this, this microbiota? So this is far from being a naive question. You are asking something <laughs> 100 years to, <laughs> to address. Sure. But I mean, like diversity, like I was just thinking if there's, if the diversity is related somehow to immune response as well, obviously, if there was a correlation, like if it was less diverse in oral, is it also less diverse in gut? These kind of just sort of generic type questions, if it was just a hyperactive immune system or a not very good, you know. Yeah, yeah, and, and even I, I might maybe reply to, to your previous question about the longitudinal <laughs> studies about the microbial composition. This is one of the challenges because yeah. We don't know how we are going to reveal or to detect how it evolves in time. I mean, yeah. what extent we have differences. On. So this is, again, one of the, the challenges in at the data analysis level. Mm -hmm. but there are some few studies. Mm -hmm. that in that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, you have a question in the chat, in the Q&A. Uh, let me see. Yeah. I'll ask about the relationship between one bacterial genus and the severity of CAD or the efficiency. Um, the second question is if these identified could be potential drug targets. So the first part of the question, let me check the relationship between one bacterial genus and severity of cardiovascular disease, you mean? Or some modes. Yeah, I think he's asking if there's yeah. a, if this if the correlation between microbiome and severity of disease, and also if there's a drug response issue. Yes. Yeah, so in our cases, uh, we have uh, grading the complexity of CAD in our patients uh, using the uh, Syntax score, for example, or the uh, degree of uh, of stenosis, and we try to uh, to perform statistical analysis and uh, in search of correlation between uh, the oral microbiota composition and the severity and the progression of uh, the disease. But in our cases, we don't find a significant association between uh, uh, the severity of the uh, uh, disease and uh, the oral microbiota composition, maybe because we have uh, a few uh, few sample. Uh, and I, I, like I said before, I think that the uh, largest number of uh, uh, diseased um, persons will clarify uh, about many uh, questions. So uh, the second part is their efficiency, efficiency of such a drug uh, that could be a potential drug target. I, I, I really don't have uh, an answer about that. Um, uh, I think that uh, uh, for the genetics uh, files, there is um, there is uh, SMP and genes that are related uh, and correlated directly to the response of drug, but uh, relation between the microbiota and the response to a drug, uh, I really don't have an idea. I guess hard because the cause effect issue, you don't know if the 
Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I, I assume uh, the coronary artery disease is quite heterogeneous. Uh, so uh, when you look at these, is there a major subtype that you try to focus on to minimize the heterogeneity in the, the uh, genotype-phenotype relationship? Uh, could you repeat the question? <laughs> my question uh, is, my question is that, you know, it's like a heart disease, a coronary artery disease. Yes. Quite heterogeneous. So some people may have it because they had a congenital heart defects, or some people may have it because of uh, cholesterol clogging up their vessel. Yes, so yes. There are all kinds of different causes for coronary artery disease. So depending on those subtype of these uh, complex common diseases, I assume, I mean, there's a possibility that the, the microbiome, that a uh, factor, whatever the, uh, the, the a species that you're looking at may differ. And, 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 and I, I understand that you only have 20 cases, so it is sort of, uh, <laughs> you know, a, a theoretical yes. discussion. But uh, it, so, so given that you have a funding for 20 samples, what I... Did you try to uh, focus on a major subtype or something so that you sort of eliminate artificially that the heterogeneity that you may experience with respect to the causal relationship? Yes. So generally, our uh, our uh, deceased uh, individuals presents. Uh, uh, risk factors like uh, diabetes, hypertension, uh, dyslipidemia, uh, and uh, uh, there are the most frequent and most known uh, risk factors of uh, CAD. So, uh, like you say, we uh, we were not able to subgroup our uh, uh, deceased uh, samples. Uh, to, uh, to observe a potential association between uh, a risk factor uh, inducing the uh, CAD and uh, the uh, oral uh, microbiota composition. Yeah, yeah, this is actually the, the biggest limit is that the sample size is very limiting in subgrouping or making subgroup or stratific stratified analysis of, of the data, the data, yeah. Yeah, thank you very much. Do we have other questions? I think we are running out of time. <laughs> so we have a very, very rich, as I expected, of course, <laughs> a rich discussion <laughs> and with different points of views of or crossing ideas. So uh, I really enjoyed it very much. And I am willing to not miss the coming conferences <laughs> like I did previously. <laughs> so it will be my pleasure to be with you again for the next conference of the next one. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, all. Thank you. Thank you. Nice to meet you. Thank you very much, all of you. Yeah. I hope to see you soon. You're all always welcome. Uh, we're always happy to have these discussions. And it's really fun for me as well because it's a bit outside what I normally do. And those are the most interesting talks, especially given that the focus of this workshop is on the underlying reasoning rather than the details, rather yeah. than focus on analysis methods or techniques. It's just like, what yeah. are the questions? How do we think about the questions? And it's really fun to think about different types of problems that are related. So I really appreciate you did a great job and it was really wonderful to meet all of you. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. So see you soon. Yeah. Au revoir. But, we'll be back, I think, but, April 5th, I think, is the next one. Yeah, and 5th of April, I think. Right, so we hope to see you all again. So thank you. Thank you. One thank month you. From now. Goodbye. Yep. Bye. Goodbye. <laughs>